So I, I think we're going to be talking today about the subject of identity, what propels these um, panelists who have written in all forms, um, why they have written their memoirs, and why this is important, and what does it say about the craft. So let me introduce you to this incredible panel. First is Richard Blanco. Uh, he is a poet. He was President Obama's inaugural poet in 2013, mm -hmm. and most recently published the collection How to Love a Country. Um, and you, Richard, read a poem um, at the opening session, which was gorgeous. Uh, you were born to Cuban uh, exiled parents and raised in Miami. Uh, you have done, um, you are a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, you've taught at universities, um, have written essays and other memoirs. So another cross sort of genre person. Um, I, Danny Shapiro is the author of five memoirs and five novels. And uh, she will be um, reading from her inheritance, uh, her best-selling book right now, A Memoir of Genealogy, Paternity, and Love. She too has also written across genres, essays, uh, journalism, in various magazines and anthologies. And sitting right next to me is Kiese, um, who is a professor of English and creative writing at the University of Mississippi. He too is an author of three books and his most recently critically acclaimed um, Heavy, an American memoir. Um, and Kiese, you're now living pretty close back to your hometown um, in Oxford, Mississippi. So we have a really broad uh, array of panelists. We have Miami. We have the Upper West Side of New York represented, <laughs> and we have the Deep South. Um, so I'm excited to get started. So I think really, honestly, the, the 101 question here is, you've all written across genres, poetry, novels, essays. Why do you write a memoir? So let's, let's start with you, Richard, at the end there. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that um, every memoir, I've written two memoirs, and I think every memoir has sort of a, a, a different reason for being, a different sort of impulse. Uh, the first memoir uh, that I wrote was uh, about my experiences of serving as inaugural poet, uh, a presidential inaugural poet, and that was just, uh, I just needed to write that down to feel like it really happened. It was the six most like incredible weeks of my life. <laughs> And so that took on a very different flavor, a very different reason. Um, the Prince of Los Cucuyos uh, was, uh, in a way, I had exhausted my life in poetry, <laughs> like my story. And I was kind of curious, just out of almost creative curiosity, what would my life look like without line breaks? And thinking about mm -hmm. when I unpack those stories, and it's really <laughs> interesting that my memoir is kind of half of my first book of poetry just unpacked into story. And I knew I wanted to tell so many stories. But I think at the bottom line of all this, and I, and I think we will probably have similar answers, is that ultimately uh, we're trying to find our own story. We have to find out something, you know, life passes us by, we're imprinted, these things happen, we're going about our daily world, we're writing other books, and it's a time to pause and say, what did that mean? What is that memory? What about why are these things haunting me? And we come to the page through art to figure it out. Ultimately, the, I also want to say, because memoir, memoir is an interesting genre because if one thing I learned, it's, not, it's, it's art, right? And it's sometimes, it's not just telling your story, but it's how does art let you tell the story you didn't even know you had? And, right, it's not a factual list right, of what right, happens in your right. life. So I come, in the same ways I come to other genres as well, I think in, in a similar ways to find out about the self and ultimately let go of the self and give that to the reader, um, and that's part of the, the process of, I think, of artists in general. But So Danny, uh, same question, but also I, I think when you, you read Danny's book or when I read your book, there, there is a real sense that of, of, of feeling of otherness from sort of the get-go, from the beginning of your childhood. Um, so here's your, then you have a, a, an active event that happens that, that surely changes your life. Right, so, um, I wrote, I've written five memoirs. No one is more shocked about that than me. <laughs> um, I was recently described in a piece that was written about me as a public contemplative. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's, that's what I've become. Um, I, when I first began writing memoir, it was because I thought that my autobi autobiographical material was haunting my fiction. And I wrote my first memoir, Slow Motion, as sort of a curative for that because I felt like my fiction was constantly thematically coming around to one way or another um, some kind of catastrophic, shocking event happening to the narrator. Um, no matter what it was, it always kind of 
just came back to that, um, to that place, to those themes. But so three years ago, um, I made the discovery uh, that was shocking and t wholly unexpected and that I wasn't looking for, that my dad, who I've written about a lot, for those of you who've read my work, um, the dad who raised me had not been my biological father. And I felt almost instantly yeah. that um, everything had led to this, mm -hmm. that all of my writing, um, you know, when I would say why memoir, what was I digging for? Why was all of my fiction in some way or another thematically revolving around family secrets? Mm -hmm. And it turned out that I was the family secret. Mm -hmm. You know, I wrote in Inheritance, I always knew there was a secret. What I didn't know, the secret was me. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's some way in which we always know. And um, there's a phrase in Inheritance that I think sums up maybe the memoiristic impulse, which is the unthought known. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a psychoanalytic phrase, but the thing that we absolutely know in our bones, but it's too dangerous to think, we can't let ourselves think it. And so when we write it, we're not thinking it, we're sort of following the line of words, and it's a discovery. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a great mm -hmm. quote in the beginning of your book uh, that I latched onto by Orwell, if you want to keep a secret, you must hide mm -hmm. it from yourself. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, yes, the, the, the knowing that you're, always other, and then finally coming through. And Kiese, tell us why you wrote this memoir, because in the beginning of your book, which I won't give away, but you, you tell us what you try, you know, you tried writing something else, but then you yeah. landed here. Yeah, thank y'all for coming out today. Um, my mother had me when she was 19 years old. She was my first friend, my first librarian, <laughs> my first teacher. Um, and she fed me books from the time I was like one or two years old. And we just got to a point in our life where we were being swallowed by different kinds of addiction, um, eating too much, starving too much, drinking too much, doing other kinds of things. And for me, I mean, I wish it was, I wish I could make it sound more literary, but we were just at a point where our, our relationship was literally about to die. Uh, both of us, I don't know how we would have lived much longer if we kept going the route we were going. And again, the gift she gave me was the gift of rereading and the gift of rewriting. So I wanted to try to use the art that she gave me on the base level to attempt to save our relationships, which I thought would also be an attempt to save our lives. And I was judging a lot of memoir contests at the time, so I could look and see what memoirs were doing well and what memoirs weren't doing well. And most memoirs I read were kind of obsessed with this notion of progress. And I just wanted to kind of create a, a, a memoir that obliterated that notion of progress. And to mm -hmm. do that, I had to not just write a memoir, but I had to write a memoir to my mother, mm -hmm. who was the first person who taught me how to use words to survive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to get more specific with um, each of your work. But um, for the consumers of memoirs, which many of us are here, I, and I was just telling Danny this, you know, I was always a little afraid to read a memoir because part of it, the, the joy of reading for me was knowing I was entering a different world and that there was this distance between the writer um, and the story. And I could accept that. Um, so I guess my, my, my question is, um, how do you feel about bridging that distance um, and telling your story out to the world? One of the things that I often say to people who say you must feel so exposed or um, who have the sense that there's no difference between me and my story is you didn't just read my diary, right. you know, and if you did, I'd have to kill you. Right. Right. There's so much that goes into, I mean, I actually think good memoir is uh, in many ways the act of transcending your life because you have to be able to see it in a way. You are discovering, but you're also attempting to see, like when I was writing Inheritance, I thought, all right, this is the story that I got, I didn't ask for it. I'd like to send it back to the story store, but this, is my, this has always been my story, and now I've discovered it. So what am I learning? What am I learning about otherness? What am I learning about identity? What am I learning about nature versus nurture? What am I learning about what makes a family a family or what makes a father a father? And I actually had to think about those things because the details of the story were so bonkers right. that I, I actually had to consider it, and to consider it, I was both inside of my story and transcending it and looking at it and shaping it and thinking, how is this going to do the ultimate work of any kind of story, which is connect to the reader? 
I mean, Richard, do you, did you feel a vulnerability when you put all that down or you were just? You know, it's interesting because I, I also get the question even more so in poetry, mm -hmm. which seems even more vulnerable. And um, hmm. I think, I think it, the transcendence again, to, to echo that word again, is part of the process. But I do, begin, I do think that whether it's a poem or memoir, it kind of begins in almost this, uh, needs to begin in this kind of selfish, passionate, it's my life, this happened to me, I need to understand this for myself. And through the art, through the, through the, through the discipline of craft, through shaping and forming, you, your, your artistic persona comes out and it's, like, it's almost like someone so starts sitting right next to you and starts telling you your story. And in that way, you're able to process in a way that you wouldn't if you just stay in the moment, if you just stay in the pain, or if you just stay in the humor, or if you just stay mm -hmm. in the memory. And I think, and so somewhere along that line, that switches. And then I don't feel vulnerable because, um, you know, in a poem either, because it, to me, it's art. It, it, it's art. And until it becomes art, I do feel vulnerable, right? Yeah. So, so it, my process is how do I speak a truer truth to myself and to my reader? And then there is, and it's a tricky thing because it's not, it's not like it's a made up me, but it's my, it's my other self, the self that knows the stuff that I didn't know. As I always say, my poems and my books are smarter than I ever am, right? Mm -hmm. And so in that way, the art has that, that, that nice barrier. And the art is the bridge because when you do that, I think the reader's able to enter into your story as well because the art invites it, uh, invites them to, to look at themselves in the mirror, um, in, in the mirror of your life. And those, those two lives start blurring together in that one reflection of art. And yeah, Kiese, so your, your memoir is to your mother. You write that you wanted to write a lie but that, and that this book was to essentially save both of your lives. Mm -hmm. But again, tell us about sort of the, it's still not easy to, for any of you to kind of put it down. Put the words down? Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Do any of y'all think it's easy to put the words down? <laughs> I guess we should start by saying that that's bullshit. Oh. <laughs> Can we cuss that aspen? <laughs> yeah. I forgot. The, I, I said forgot yes, the, and we're doing it. I forgot to ask. Um, I don't think it's going to bleep you out either. No. Nah, I, I, you know, for me, the, the, the artfulness and rigor of what we do is part of how we can get close to honesty. I'm still not sure what the truth is. As a memoirist, we talked this morning, Danny, for a while, and, you know, we didn't really use the word truth that much. Yeah. Though I think a lot of people who come to memoir expect a particular kind of right. truth. But... For me, I mean, I, like everybody else in this room, I have what I think was the truth of my upbringing, of my mother's upbringing, of my grandmother's upbringing. Um, but for me, I had to talk to them about what my memory told me, compare that to what their memory told them, and then artfully try to render that with some, some form of integrity. For example, um, in my book, I talk early in the book about getting kicked out of school because initially I thought my friend pulled out this apple. We went to this white school. I thought he pulled out an apple. I thought he pulled out a really dull plastic butter knife to cut the apple. And there was this white woman teacher who resembled Wendy. Y'all remember Wendy from the Wendy's commercials, but she was much <laughs> older. And that was my memory for like decades. I was mm -hmm. like, wow, Miss Collins kicked us out of the room because you tried to cut apple. When I talked to my friend um, Derek, Derek was like, nah, brother, that wasn't an apple. That was a grapefruit. And I was like, oh, grapefruit makes better art than an apple between two black boys. Grapefruit's very succulent, very wet. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but that was a plastic knife, right? <laughs> and then he was like, no, nah, bro, that was a sharp knife. Like, <laughs> she kicked us out of school because we were using knives in the beginning of class. And, 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 and you know, it hurts when your version of yeah. truth collides with somebody else's version of truth yeah. who has no reason to lie, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, like, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes like that where the artful rigor of attempting to compare my idea of truth to other people's idea of truth, I think, can create a particular kind of art that has some integrity. It doesn't mean that it's true, but mm -hmm. I think it can have more integrity. You know? yeah. I think if I may speak for all of us, I think some, some, something even more basic is we just love storytelling. I think, I think that's an impulse that um, no matter, no matter, I think how you know what your life's about, that you're you're getting to the page because ultimately you want to tell a story, and in right. the art of storytelling, these things happen. Right. You, you, it's not about the truth; it's about that storytelling. The truth is is the truth is again sort of the basis of it. But um, we just I don't know. I just love to tell our stories. It's part yeah. of the heart of of what the theme is, of yeah. course. You know, I've, I've, as, as someone who's written these multiple memoirs, I've seen the way that the truth 
changes. Right. Um, and I've come to really believe that it's the relationship between the self and the story at a particular moment in time that is the story. Um, it would be a really interesting exercise, and maybe in fact this is what I'm doing with my life, to write the same book every 10 years over the course of a lifetime, because it would be a completely different book. Um, there was a moment where I was writing my memoir, Devotion, where I realized I was writing a scene that I had written in my memoir, Slow Motion, 10 years earlier. And it was the moment uh, where I found out that my father had died. And I was in the hospital, and my mother was very badly injured in an accident that had killed my father. And so I'm writing this scene in Devotion. I know it's in slow motion. I can go back and look at slow motion. It's on the bookshelf right behind me, but I don't. I write the scene, I polish the scene, and then I go back and look at slow motion. So in Devotion, um, my half-sister walks into the hospital. My father has just died. It's a cold February day. The sky's blue. I'm wearing a black skirt and a gold blouse, because it was the 80s, and um, <laughs> boots, because this is how you dress to go to the hospital to see your parents. And, um, and my father has just died, and my sister says, where's dad? And I say, his, his body is still in, in his room. And I was from an Orthodox Jewish family. My sister said, um, you're, you're not supposed to leave the body unattended. How could you have done that? Mm. Right? So I, I write this scene, and I go back and I look at slow motion. Cold February day, same outfit, same everything, standing in the same place. And my father's younger brother, my uncle, walks into the hospital and says, where's your father? And I say, he, he's still in his room. He said, how could you have left the body mm -hmm. unattended? It was the same dialogue. It was the same outfit. It was the same weather. It was the same everything. Mm -hmm. And it came from the mouths of two different characters. And there was no one to, I actually didn't even think of trying to align them. I didn't, my uncle was dead. I didn't call my sister. Would her memory have been truer than mine? Was my memory truer because it was closer to the events or because it was further away from the events? I actually just thought it was a great teaching point and I was gonna totally, I totally let it stand because that's memory. Uh, again, I think for the, the consumer in me, um, you know, there is this, as I said earlier, implicit tackling of cultural identity um, in, a, in a memoir that I do think is, you know, often more raw or more distinct. Um, you're often writing about your childhood or um, even, Dan, in your book, you do go back to your childhood and uh, the, the same with Heavy, of course. Um, but uh, so, so talk to me, Richard, about that because yours is, uh, well, all of yours is very specific, but you know, start with that cultural identity. Did that propel you first, or you're just writing about your family and? Um, it's always you been, were seeking that. Yeah, you, I mean, yeah, it's always been it's always been the the central obsession across genres. It's this idea of home and place, belonging, identity, and even when I try to run away from it, it surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and and there was so much, like I said, in the poetry that the poetry was able to do. And I felt urged to write a memoir to unpack a lot of the backstory, a lot more humor. Poetry can't hold humor too well. Um, so there was a lot of characters that I hadn't written about. But it was all in that sense of uh, that, that, that the same themes of belonging um, and finding home and cultural identity. And not only for myself, and I think this was a particular impulse to, to that memoir too, was to what I call being an his, his, uh, emotional historian. The idea that I also mm -hmm. wanted to document the lives of my community and my village, mm -hmm. so to speak, my proverbial village. So that was part of it. Um, I find it, um, I, I find myself uh, in, at times, uh, people, I think some writers that are, uh, pigeonholed into being ethnic writers or Cuban writers or whatnot, they take offense to some of these things. Um, I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a weirdo in that way. I, I feel like if God has given me uh, almost like a task or like uh, if I can use words to be an ambassador to help us all understand each other better, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I love that. I love that charge. I love that territory that has been given me. Um, though sometimes it can be annoying, but um, but um, so I, I use the book also to share to to bridge cultures and to teach people what is it like to be an exile growing up in in Miami at a certain time and period, and of course the underlying the underlying. Uh, uh, thing under all of that is that we're all human, right? It's all about pain, mm -hmm. loss, longing, joy, you know, humor, tragic comic self. I do find one thing really interesting, and I can't always wrap my head around it. 
oftentimes, and I read from the memoir, and people will come up to the line, buy the line, like four copies, and they're like, we loved, you know, we love your grandmother, we love what you read, like, this is so funny, yada, yada, yada. And then they pull out the book, and they say, can you make this out to Juan, my neighbor? <laughs> and can you make this one to uh, uh, El Elvita, my, <laughs> my sister-in-law's next door neighbor? <laughs> and can you make, I'm like, and they feel they can't own the story. Mm. And I'm like, that's like saying, I can only, if I can't read Russian novels unless I'm Russian, or mm -hmm. I can't hear, like going to reading to Robert Frost and say, can you make this out to my friend, so someone who lives in New Hampshire, <laughs> you know? And it's yeah. really interesting, they're loving the book, and sometimes something is, doesn't give them permission sometimes to, uh, to just self-identify, you know, cultural, cultural, cultural aspects aside, that these are just people trying to find a way in their life, trying to love, full of loss, yeah. full of triumph, full of resilience, and we all connect with that, and they're not sort of, they're connecting to that, but somehow they, they sometimes they resist the storyline. Well, I think that's a big issue for today, that sort of cultural appropriation, you know, only certain people can like certain things or write about certain experiences, um, so that's an interesting point about can you sign it for Juan, um, but, uh, um, you know, Casey, I, I think when, you know, again, when I sort of looked at your book for the second time, you, there is a struggle, I think, to sort of tell your experience, but also tell the bigger experience of the, you know, the, the black experience in the South. You're, you're, you're writing it to your mother, but I, I think there was a tension there of how you wanted to show essentially that story as well. Am I wrong or... Not on no, the no, 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 I think yeah. you're right. Um, I think that tension exists for almost every black writer I know mm -hmm. in that, you know, this isn't an epistolary novel, epistolary memoir. It's a book written directly to my mother. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing I always have to say when I talk at places like this is that though I wrote that book to my mother and we worked on that book together, you know, my editor is a white woman from Massachusetts. My agent is a white brother from the Midwest, all my publicists are from some part of Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> the, the people they try to sell the right. books to are for the most part white. So I wish I could sit up here and talk about like this essential narrative that I got, mm -hmm. but there's so many white hands in my book. And the reason that is either a problem or interesting is because I know lots of white writers in this world and none of them ever have to worry about all these black hands digging yeah. into their work before mm -hmm. it comes out. So I think that's important. But I also think what's most important, because I want to think about what Danny said, is this notion of revising memoir after memoir. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and I have to revise, because thankfully we live in a culture now where most people I know accept that the world is filled with racism, mm -hmm. cis heteropatriarchy, trans antagonism. But I think sometimes we talk about those things as if they're over there and our imaginations and our memories are somehow innocent. And so the reasons I have to revise How to Solely Kill Yourself and Others in Long Division in order to get to a book like Heavy is because those forces mm -hmm. of anti-blackness, of white supremacy, of trans antagonism are so um, infectious. And I think sometimes we think when we see our books bound that somehow the books have transcended that particular kind of evil. But heavy for me, beyond being, I think, the best thing I've ever written, is also, I think, the most just liberatory thing I've ever written. Mm -hmm. And it is filled with anti-blackness, and it is filled with renditions of white supremacy, and it is filled with different kinds of misogyny that I hope to artfully deal with in my next text. I just think, for me as a memoirist, I have to say that, because sometimes I think people come to these things, people who've read your book, and they're like, oh, you're so honest, and they place you on this pedestal and whatnot, and I'm just trying to work through the fucked up shit that everybody else is working yeah. through. <laughs> I'm just doing it in book form. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Danny, yes, I mean, we, I, I feel like I remember a time where we had our villages, but yet we were also sort of moving together, but seems unlike that now. But Danny, you grew up in a very small sort of community too on the Upper West Side um, and an Orthodox Jewish community that, you know, suffered its own uh, issues, but, you know, also was restrictive in a lot of ways and I, I think contributed to your otherness as well or feeling of otherness. Well, what I've come to realize is that what contributed to my feeling of otherness was that there was this massive secret that was kept from me about my very identity. And so, yes, I grew up in this observant Jewish world, but every day of my life, this is not an exaggeration, every day, someone told me that I didn't look Jewish. Right. Mm. Every day. Yeah. 
When I was three years old, I was a Kodak Christmas poster child, <laughs> wishing the entire world a Merry Christmas. Well, and it was, and also... it was like in my, in my household, it was like, oh, that's so funny. We're pulling the wool over all of their eyes. <laughs> um, and of course, I was in fact, um, my biological father is from Western Europe. His family came over here on the Mayflower. Yeah. So that was hidden within me. And I think, you know, one of the things I've talked a lot about since the book came out is that our identities are the received stories. And, you know, from the time that we're very, very young, they're what we're told about ourselves, and then they become our stories. But I was formed by what I didn't know, but I didn't know I didn't know it. You know, like, for example, someone who's adopted might never know who their biological parents are, but they know that they don't know. And I'm not saying that's easy, but it's true. I had a very diff so I grew up with this sense that there was something that didn't add up about me, because it didn't. So it was incredibly, talk about liberating, incredibly liberating, though very painful and shocking and destabilizing initially, ultimately really liberating to know, oh, that makes so much sense now. Hmm. And I think it turned me into a writer from the very beginning, because I think I was digging and digging and digging for what I didn't know, but I was digging, whether it was fiction or whether it was memoir, that sense of something's elusive, something's just out of grasp, and I'm just trying to reach it. Well, I think for all of your work, too, I mean, there is a grasping, you know, you're, you're all grasping in, in, in all different ways to, to, to wrestle with the truth, but I think to also give us the truth, your truth, too. Um, so I'd love, um, Cassie, do you, would you like to read something from your work oh, sure. so people can get a sense of where you're coming from? <laughs> okay. <laughs> where I'm coming from. All right. And where you want to go? Um, I'll just read a page. That's fine. Cool. Okay. Yeah. You were still snoring when Malachi Hunter pulled his black Volvo into our driveway. You woke up when I tried to kill a revolutionary black man from Mississippi. Two hours later, you and Malachi Hunter took one glass of wine to your bedroom. From my bed, I heard long tail rats hiking through walls, wet tires skating past our windows, and Johnny Carson's nasal monologue. I couldn't hear your voice, the only voice I wanted to hear when I woke up, the last voice I wanted to hear before going to sleep. I opened the bedroom door and walked down the hallway a few feet from your bedroom. Behind the locked door, Malachi Hunter said he was sorry for punching you in your face, sorry for making you bleed, sorry for fighting your son, sorry for punishing you for wanting to know the truth. You told Malachi Hunter you wanted a daughter and you were sorry for running away. I went back to my room and heard your bedroom door lock and unlock and lock again. The many squeaks from your bed got louder. I got on my knees and prayed to God not to hear you wailing under the weight of the revolutionary black man from Mississippi. I hated my body. I walked in the kitchen, got the biggest spoon I could find and dipped it halfway in the peanut butter and pear preserves grandmama had given us. I heard the wailing all the way in the kitchen. I dipped the same spoon a quarter deep into grandmama's pear preserves and put the whole spoon in my mouth. I did it again and again and again until the jar of peanut butter was gone. But the wailing didn't stop. I hated my body. Before leaving the kitchen, I gulped down a few mason jars of boxed wine until I forgot the shape of the sound I was running from. When I was supposed to be finishing my report for you on Fannie Lou Hamer, I wrote instead about losing my 12-year-old heavy black body to an emergency I was too sad, too drunk and really too terrified to identify. Early the next morning, I had my first wet dream. I was afraid to tell you what my body did while you were in Malachi Hunter's room because I knew you'd ask me why. Though I never wanted you to touch me again, I didn't want to lie to you. Lying to you felt like cheating, and cheating felt like something that I never wanted to do to my best friend. I think as a mother, you writing to your mother kind of slays me every time. Um, so, um, you know, thank you for the, I'm not sure what question to ask you after that. You have to so, ask a question. Um, you know. um, so, um, Danny, would you also give us a snippet of your work? Um, yes, I, listening to Kiese, I just changed my mind about what I was gonna read. <laughs> but I opened right to it, so maybe it was meant to be 
so this is, um, I'll just read about a page two. Um, uh, I go to visit my 93, my then 93 and a half year old aunt, my father's younger sister, to tell her what I've discovered, um, mostly because I'm afraid that um, she may know something, and if she knows something, um, I'm just looking for answers, even though I know it's gonna be very painful for her. I think there was great nobility in what Paul did at that time, Shirley said. The Lubavitcher Rebbe offered him a very easy moral out to keep post, well, sorry, I'm gonna start someplace else. Um, my eyes had not stopped stinging with tears. Shirley, are you surprised that my father never said anything to you about their, tr their struggle with infertility? Not at all, she said. He would have felt very private about it. That's something that would have been in the deepest interior of their marriage. You would have been protective of your mother. You're not an accident of history, Danny, Shirley said. Her eyes were brimming. Not as far as I'm concerned and not as far as the world is concerned. This isn't about the cold scientific facts. I have to tell you, in every way, and I'm not saying this to make you feel good and I'm taking a chance saying it because you'll think I'm making it up, but between you and Paul, there was paternity, ownership, kinship. She trained her whole 93-year-old self, every cell in her being, in the direction of consoling me. Every bit of energy. It was the purest manifestation of love I had ever experienced. Knowing what you know, you're more of a daughter to Paul than you can possibly imagine. You take something that isn't your own and you breathe life into it. You create it and it becomes your creation. You are an agent to help my brother express the finest kind of love. Her hand rested on top of mine. It's rare that you get the opportunity in life to stand outside of yourself. It's as if God is saying, child, come sit next to me and now look. Finding all this out is a door to discovering what a father really is. It isn't closure. You may never get to have that, but it is an opening to a whole new vista. For the first time since the, that evening in June when I'd stared uncomprehendingly into my computer screen, I felt a sense of peace. At least for the moment, the constant ache was gone. Mm. And you dedicated your book to your father. Um, so um, that's a very, for me, a very moving moment um, with that passage too, because he really was your hero despite um, the secret. Um, so Richard, um, the Prince of Los Cucuyos, um, you know, an immigrant family um, sounded a lot like my New York Jewish family to a certain extent. And, and yes. Richard and I talked about sort of humor and the use of humor um, in memoir. And I got to tell you, um, you know, this it was it was beautiful, funny, um, but essentially about this family trying to assimilate um, and really not wanting to actually interact with any Americans, like holy right. Americans. Um, <laughs> So the, the clash of them trying to, to assimilate is both you know, heartbreaking and also laugh out loud funny. Oh um, and I think you've brought this spin to it that many immigrants, uh, recent immigrants and even old time immigrants um, like my grandparents or great grandparents felt. So would you read something, please? Sure, sure. And um, I've been dying to do the test myself because <laughs> I'm convinced, like you said, that, you're not. That, you're that not. I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> There's some part of me. I was just always Cuban wanted to be Jews, a little Jewish grandmother yeah. since I was a kid. <laughs> like, but anyway, um, so <laughs> I got to set this up just a little bit. Um, so I'm going to read a, a, a comical, humorous piece. But I also want to say that I, I, it's not something I purposely did in the memoir just to do it, mm -hmm. but rather it was a reflection of my family of the tragic comic sense of Guanos, of Latin, Latinx in general, I think, uh, to some point fatalistic to the point of comical, right? Mm -hmm. And so my grandmother is a, is a protagonist throughout most of the memoir, and so she's in here. And this is just one part of the memoir that I wish I was really just lying to you 
but I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> watch. <laughs> and then also, when we were talking about genres and how the truth comes up in different ways, it was interesting to me that my grandmother in my poetry is this much drawn much more darkly, uh, uh, just much more uh, insidious. My mother, on the other hand, is this angelic woman in my poetry. In the memoir, the genre, the art demanded something different. So my grandmother, I realized the truth, the truth that I didn't know was my grandmother was also my best friend and my antagonist at the same time. Um, and that um, I think we all have someone like this in our life, that person that we're always butting up against and is our greatest teacher, our greatest detractor, our greatest cheerleader, our greatest enemy. And that, and I read that memoir, it let me learn that. It let me, it let me hate her enough to hate, to finally love her. And so uh, very similar, I yeah. think, to, to yeah. all of your work, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> when I was younger, I was a finicky eater. You look like un gargajo, a piece of phlegm. Skinny, frail, like a woman. Oh, somebody's need to eat a lot, Abuela insisted, and began fattening me up with concoctions of sweetened condensed milk mixed with Coca-Cola, all the easy cheese I wanted, double portions of rice with frijoles negros at dinner, and mandatory desserts. But now that I was 20 pounds overweight, she was mortified. Bad enough being a sissy, but a fat sissy? Gewa, <laughs> you have to lose all that gordura. And so began her campaign to slim, me, <clears throat> to slim me down. She made me ride bike 10 times around the block every day after school and roller skate twice a week for an hour up and down the walkway wrapped in garbage bags so I could sweat that fat out. <laughs> she even agreed to my request for a pogo stick, just like the one my cousin Marlene had after I convinced her that pogoing would be good exercise, although she immediately cut the plastic tassels off the handlebars. After weeks of watching Abuela torment me, Mama spoke up, albeit with caution. Bueno, he's not that fat, she told Abuela. He's more like como husky, she said, husky. <laughs> mispronouncing the English word she had learned from the husky section of the boys' department at Kmart where she brought all my husky clothes. <laughs> I was looking forward to the summer, running errands all day with my grandparents and their baby blue comet that smelled like oranges, playing Aquaman with the Teofelia swimming pool, watching The Price is Right and reruns of I Love Lucy all afternoon, sitting on the couch in my underwear and munching on cheese puffs. But all that changed a week before school let out. What Ricky needs is hard work, a good trabajo. That will make him un hombre. He's old enough. It's time. Abuela pronounced at dinner, speaking to my parents about me in the third person as if I weren't sitting right across from her. Además, she continued, working, he will lose weight and all that fat so that his peepee -pee will grow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if he doesn't lose all that fat before he turns 13, his peepee -pee will shrivel up, <laughs> become nada. I gulped. My peepee -pee shriveled right then and there. <laughs> Except for Kako choking on his food as he tried to stifle his laughter, complete silence followed Abuela's announcement. She shoved another mound of black beans and rice onto her fork with her pudgy thumb, stuffed it in her mouth, and continued talking, pausing only to chew. Remember what happened to Juan El Bobo back in Cuba? I warned his mother, but she didn't listen to me. Then it was too late. He had to have an operation, and they still couldn't pull it out. <laughs> there is always some character of Willa in some town in Cuba who served as a perfect example of some good, or in my case, bad fortune. She continued with her plan. Yavale with Don Gustavo. He'll let him help out at a Cocuyito, which is the grocery store, all summer for $55 a week, then delivered her ultimatum. He goes to work. Well, say no, he goes back to baseball at Flagami. No, anything but baseball, I thought. Flashing back to those dreadful 98 degree afternoons in left field, shooing away gnats, terrified of fire ants, the fly balls I could never catch, and the booze every single time I struck out at bat. I hated baseball, and Abuela knew it. She knew I wouldn't object to working at El Cocuyito, given the alternative. Once again, my parents didn't protest. Bueno, we'll see, was all Mama could say to her. Maybe. Vamos a ver, 
Papa said, but I knew the deal was done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, I think we're going to move to questions. Oh, we're going to definitely move to questions. Um, but I, 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 I thank you all for the bravery of being an artist, but also for me, the bravery of writing your memoirs. Um, and um, I'm in awe of being around you guys. Um, and I'm so pleased that you're here. And uh, um, I feel joy at your work. Um, and I know uh, all of you will feel the same when you read their work. So before I take Q&A, I just want to tell you the logistics here. Um, after the session, um, all of the three writers will be signing books right over there in that patio. Um, and uh, Kiese will also um, continue reading over at the Bucky Dome um, right after, so um, at around 4.30, right? Kiese? <laughs> right. Listening to you. Uh, so um, we will get more of that. And also to let you know that we had a great moment this morning with um, Danny, um, who has a po podcast called Family Secrets with iHeartRadio, who interviewed Kiese um, for season two. So there's great synergy here. I'm so glad you're here. And let's go to questions. Oh, my goodness. Yes, sir. Well, I think is there mics? Yes. Front row, please. That was a quick on the button. That's the fastest I've ever seen. Thank you, uh, thank you for this wonderful session. Question I have is, when you're writing and when you're thinking about your memoirs, are you thinking about helping other people? Mm -hmm. Who are you writing for? You've talked about writing for yourself, but are you trying to help other people through their lives? I, I think that's a great question. Is there a greater good here? Yes. I, I think I, I have certainly had the experience of my work helping people, but I think that if I was sitting down thinking I'm going to help people, I probably wouldn't write as well. Um, I guess that's the way that I would answer it, is that it feels to me um, I'm trying to connect with people. Um, yeah, that's better. This new book of mine is helping a lot of people, but as I was writing it, I was trying to tell the story and trying to place the story in a larger context. Um, so there's an extraordinary experience in realizing that there is a purpose to it now. Um, but, but I didn't set, I think there, there, a self-consciousness can set in if, um, if a writer sits down to think, now I'm going to write something that's going to help people. Yeah. I, I think connect is the perfect word mm -hmm. because it's, it is really, you write, um, you write, and it's the artistic impulse that you know that you you want to put your life out there, but not not necessarily as help anybody. I, yeah, and I th I think connect is the perfect word, and I think in part um, that's when it comes back to you, and when those moments happen, it's great. But that's not really what keeps us writing uh, per se. It's it's it is though just knowing, um, in a way trusting that your life is in some ways, your honesty, your life, what you're trying to do in a memoir will be a, will be a mirror to someone else and that's enough, right? And, and, and that's why we do what we do in, in part, but not consciously, I think. Like but that. do you feel that way? Do you feel it was for a greater good or you wanted to? <laughs> I mean, I definitely feel like it's for a greater good, but you know, I just sort of think subject position matters a lot. Uh, first through 12th grade, I went to majority black schools with perception of one year. All my teachers were white. So not only did I have to write, write to white teachers all of my youth, those white teachers encouraged me to imitate, because I'm so thankful to be from Mississippi, and I'm so thankful for Eudora Welty, I'm so thankful for William Falk, and I'm so thankful for Robert, I'm so thankful for all the white writers that we hoist up, but those were the people I was taught to imitate. So when you ask that question, I have to say like the act of writing books to Baldwin to my mother, to Margaret Walker Alexander, is a liberatory act because I was I was aggressively taught not to see those people as audiences to whom I could write. And your audience sort of dictate dictates like I think the integrity and calibrations of your art. So I'm definitely trying to write to black folks in the in the deep south. I'm definitely trying to write for black folk in the deep south with an understanding that people outside of the deep south will also take part in it. But I know who my primary audience is, and it's the primary audience that I was told to not write to for most of my life. 
Next question, sir. Then I'll move over this way. Huh? Yeah, thank you very much for sharing your truth, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, how long did it take you to write your work? And when you were finished, how big was it? How many pages? And what did you have to, what is it now? What was your editing process? We'll start here. <laughs> uh, I'm not a good writer. I'm just a I'm pretty good reviser. So my book was shame. My book was bigger than the Bible. <laughs> Literally, fam. Like, and like, so I had to, because I thought, I mean, that's just how I have to write. You know, I have to write 20 bad sentences to find one good one. Um, I, don't, I don't know about other people on, on stage. So all of my books were like massive before I let my ego sort of shrink like your grandmother. <laughs> and, and, like, and that's when I find like the most percussive art comes out. But for me, because I, I just can't get it right the first time, I have to write tons and then shrink it down and hope that some of the subtext can carry it away from the shit that was cut out. <laughs> I mean, I started writing that book at 12 years old. Mm. So it was a very big book. Mm. Yeah. For me, I, I wrote the first 200 pages. I wrote 200 pages of inheritance very quickly. And um, then I actually, because I had a, the previous book um, that I had written was coming out and I had to go on book tour, and I put it aside for a couple of months and I came back and I reread those 200 pages and my heart just sank to my feet. Uh, they, were, mm. they were no good. Um, and I had this realization, which is that I was writing from trauma. I was writing from the immediate moment. I was trying to capture feelings that I had that I thought I wouldn't remember. So I, and I was also writing quickly because the people who were still alive who might know something about the truth of my origins were elderly. And my husband and I had this joke where I wouldn't want to call someone and my husband would say, he may be dead by Friday, <laughs> and I would pick up the phone and call. Um, but the realization I had, and I'm curious what you would say about this, Richard, is that I think maybe poems can be written from trauma, but trauma doesn't allow prose mm -hmm. to like cohere. It doesn't allow a story to be told. It's why when we're traumatized, we tell the same story over and over and over again, mm -hmm. um, in, like in trying to kind of like not have it slip through our fingers. So I had to start over again. And when I started over again, I had to find that I thought of it as a half a step away, a half a step away from the events that had happened that allowed me to pivot forward, backward, into the future. And this was a fast book for me. That probably took me about um, a year and a half to write, uh, not including the 200 pages that I wrote and threw away. That is, that is very interesting, because I think I had an easier time at it, of it, because the poetry had served as a kind of emotional mm -hmm. outline and had been with me. And so what I was trying to do is recast the story and find other dimensions of the story. But I kind of knew what, it, I, I wasn't writing out of trauma, as you say, I kind of knew, uh, I, I, knew I knew where the memoir was going in a way. Um, and so it, it became a little bit easier. I will say that I, I, never, I never thought I'd be a memoirist. I thought uh, being an engineer and I thought, I thought essays and nonfiction uh, proper were closer to poetry to the poet's mind. And I wrote all these essays, like I wrote a, a, practically a whole book of really terrible essays. <laughs> and my agent said, I really love this line. Why don't you just tell me about that? <laughs> and like, and I, was, I was using these little snippets of my life to support an, an essayistic thesis instead of just telling the story. And I never forget, he says, just tell me a story. And so I went back. So in a way, th if I add that to how long it took me, probably three to four years. Um, but not also, I, I don't know if that's working full time for any of us. I don't think we can, I can't work on a project just, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's on and off, it's pushing it away, it's getting, like you said, getting back to it after the 200 pages. So it's not actually, you know, I don't know we, if we had a meter on our chair, maybe that <laughs> maybe would be a good well, <laughs> Christmas I, gift. For I think there's, there's, some, there's something that's changed also for writers that I think is different than it was 10 years ago, which is that. Um, a publication doesn't happen and then, and then it's over. It used to be right. that yeah. you'd bring yeah. out a book, if you were lucky enough, you'd go on a little book tour, and then three weeks later, later you'd be done. You'd be back at your desk and you could start the next thing. Now, um, it's some combination of the internet and social media and um, 
book tours. Um, there's a kind of writing, um, you know, if, if I used to think of it as going into the cave and then coming out of the cave. And when you're in the cave, it's dark, and you're in there, and nothing's going to distract you. There's a do not disturb sign on the, you know, I long for those days. But then when you come out of the cave, you blink for a while, and it's all shiny and bright, and there are people. Um, and it's very hard to transition in both directions. And I think, I mean, tell me what you guys think. Yeah. It feels to me like writers have had to become more nimble at moving in and out of places of intense concentration. It's become more career-like, and so that takes up a lot of time. And great, I mean, gratefully so, but yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah. Mm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Question? Yes, in the back. Gentlemen, in the back. <laughs> you know, Danny, when you mentioned your diary, I, I felt a little cheated. Can you speak to the difference between your diary self and your <laughs> memoir self? <laughs> Oh, sure. Um, really bad writing. Yeah, really bad writing. Really boring to all the world except for me. Um, uh, mortifying. Um, you know, once in a while I'll be like on a plane with, you know, with turbulence going on and I'll think, I haven't burned them. Like I don't want anyone to read them. There, there are diaries that you read, like Cheever's diaries or certain, there's certain writers where you actually feel, Virginia Woolf has a, the, her writer's diary. There's no way you can tell me that she didn't know that that would yeah. be published yeah. someday, right? Come on. Come you know, on. She didn't just never, write like that. Those were very artful writing. diaries. Those were extremely. I just woke right. up this morning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all very much. Thank this incredible panel.